Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. Murder in the Red by Norbert Davis Part 1 The Tart from Kester Street It was still raining when Dodd's taxi slid to the curb in front of the courthouse. He pulled the collar of his coat up around his throat and sloshed quickly across the sidewalk, went three at a time up the long, broad flight of granite steps. He pushed through one of the revolving doors, went into the hall, puffing a little. Meekins, Dodd's runner, was leaning against the wall under a square gold letter sign that said, Room 101, Night Court. Meekins was a small and mild and nondescript, and the only cue to his age was the fact that he was bald and sensitive about it. He always kept his hat on whenever it was possible, and he had it on now, pulled down low over his weary eyes. You ain't any too soon, he said. He's up now, and he's sounding off again. What judge? Dodd asked. Crane, he's new. Oh, hell, said Dodd. I don't know why you think you got to front for that screwball anyway, Meekin said. It ain't as if there was any dough. Later, later, said Dodd, opening the door to 101. It was a long, high ceiling room, brightly lighted, with the spectator seats in long, curving rows in front of the railing that separated them from the court proper. There were a few bedraggled people sitting in the seats, and sure enough, Riganov was up and sounding off again. Dodd was a big man, tall and loose-jointed, with deceptively wide shoulders, and his feet made thudding echoes as he hurried down the aisle. He wore a pair of horn-rimmed glasses, patched over the nose piece with a strip of white adhesive tape, and his eyes were blue and blandly good-humored behind their rain-misted lenses. He had to fumble with a catch on the gate in the railing. Riganov went right on talking loudly. I got a right. I got a right in the Constitution. It says so. It says free speech in the Constitution. And I'm a citizen. And I got a right. Judge Crane was a thin little man, looking shrunken and pale in his black robes. And he was regarding Riganov with an air of mild, absent-minded interest. Quite so, he said. Quite so, uh, Mr. Uh, Riganov. I flatter myself that I am as familiar with your constitutional rights as you are. However, the state, in this case the municipality, has a right also. It is known generally as its police power. Under that right, it has the power to forbid acts that endanger the safety of its citizens. No one objects to your holding meetings, but you can't do it on street corners where you block traffic and menace the safety of passerbys. It's a plot, Riganoff yelled. You're just the fascist tool of the special interests. Dodd got through the gate and reached him. He caught one of Riganov's bent thin shoulders, whirled him around, and slammed him down in a chair. Shut up, he whispered fiercely. He straightened up then, smiling apologetically, and said, Your Honor, I am sorry to interrupt the court in this abrupt manner, but may I be allowed to speak for the defendant? Who are you? Crane asked mildly. My name is William Dodd, sir. Are you an attorney, Mr. Dodd? No, sir. I am a bondsman. The defendant's bondsman. That's interesting, said Crane, but hardly relevant at this stage of the proceedings. You may well be the defendant's bondsman, but that doesn't give you any status in this court. Dodd nodded. I know that. I am not acting in my professional capacity, Your Honor. I've furnished bond for the defendant several times, but I've never received any money for it. He's just a friend of mine. A philanthropic bondsman, Crane said. That's astonishing, Mr. Dodd. In fact, almost unbelievable. You've succeeded in arousing my curiosity. Go ahead. Riganov popped out of his chair. It's a plot. It's a filthy fascist plot. To silence, Riganov had a shock of bushy black hair, and Dodd put his hand on top of it and pushed hard. Riganov sat down. Your Honor, said Dodd in his most persuasive manner, this man is the janitor in the building where I have my offices. 
he slightly cracked on the subject of fascist plots. But other than that, he's perfectly harmless. He's charged with holding an unauthorized meeting on a street corner, blocking traffic and disturbing the peace. I understand he has been arrested repeatedly for the same or similar offenses. That's correct, Dot agreed, but he's still perfectly harmless. He only does things like that because his wife beats him. Ah, said Crane in amazement. Dodd nodded earnestly. She beats him. He has to express his defiance and independence and general manhood in some way, so he gets on a soapbox and yells at people. Riganoff didn't get up this time. Instead, he wiggled forward in his chair and twisted his thin brown face into a horrible grimace. Any day now, he said, we'll blow up all courthouses. All of them, Mr. Riganoff? Crane inquired, interested. Yes, Riganov snarled dramatically. All. This one here, I attend to myself personally. I put ten tons of dynamite in the cellar, and then, boom, nothing but a hole in the ground. Crane looked at Dodd. That's a rather dangerous program for him to advocate. It doesn't mean a thing, Dodd insisted, glowering at Riganov. He'd run like a rabbit if he saw a stick of dynamite. And jail, said Riganov. We let everybody out of jail and arrest all policemen and judges and put them in. Your Honor, Dodd said desperately. I've known Riganov for a long time, and he never does anything but talk. He has a good job, and if he's put in jail, he'll lose it. He doesn't sound very safe to me, said Crane. Dodd said, he's trying to get you to put him in jail, Your Honor. He has a good chance of succeeding, said Crane. But just why does he want me to put him in jail? His wife is here waiting for him. Crane looked up at the audience. If Mrs. Riganoff is in the court, will she stand up, please? A woman sitting in the front row of spectators' seats stood up slowly. She was six feet tall, but she was so enormously broad, she looked much shorter. She had a round, impassively smooth, olive-skinned face and dark, narrowed eyes that had dangerous greenish flecks of light in them. She was hatless, and she wore an old man's overcoat fastened with a safety pin in front. Yes, said Crane thoughtfully. I can understand that Mr. Riganoff might have reason to be apprehensive if his wife disapproved of his actions. She outweighs him by a hundred pounds, Dodd said, and she gets mad when he talks on street corners. Crane stroked his chin. Well, I'll tell you, Mr. Dodd, I appreciate your motives, and after seeing Mr. Riganoff, I'll discount a lot Mr. Riganoff has said, because I can understand that he'd probably prefer the safety and quiet of a jail to having an interview with his wife in the privacy of their home. But nevertheless, in view of the defendant's record, I can't just simply dismiss his case. I'll put him under a hundred dollar peace bond, Mr. Dodd. A hundred dollars? Dodd said, swallowing. Yes. You may furnish it if you wish. Arrange it with the clerk. Thank you, sir, Dodd said glumly. He arranged for the bond with the clerk. Riganoff was still sitting in his chair with a look of dazed despair on his face and Dodd hauled him up with a grip on one thin arm and steered him through the gate in the railing and up on the aisle. Mrs. Riganoff padded quietly and sinisterly along behind them. Safely out in the hall, Dodd let go of Riganoff and said, Now listen, you, I... Riganoff suddenly thrust against him, pushing him back into Mrs. Riganoff and darted frantically for the front door. Mrs. Riganoff got Dodd out of her way by the simple method of cuffing him once alongside the head and knocking him into the wall. She went after Riganoff in a deadly, swift, ponderous rush and caught him just at the door. Riganoff squealed once. His wife took a good grip on the back of his collar and dragged him back to Dodd. Dodd was feeling gingerly of the ear that had stopped her slap. What? Mrs. Riganoff asked gutturally. What happens in there? He's loose, for the time being, Dodd explained. I put up a peace bond for him. Peace bond? What is that? Money? Dodd nodded sadly. And how? A hundred dollars. If he gets arrested again, I lose it. He makes speeches. You lose money? That's it. He don't make speeches, said Mrs. Riganoff. He don't make speeches. She emphasized her words by hitting Riganoff four times. Twice on one side of the head and twice on the other. Riganoff's head bobbed like a punching bag. Meekins came down the hall, making a cautious detour around Mrs. Riganoff and spoke to Dodd. There's some more coming in now. Women, we ain't got any in this batch, so I can go out and have me a beer? I guess so, said Dodd. 
the prisoners came in through the passageway that led across to the jail. There were six of them in charge of two matrons who looked enough alike to be twins and were almost as big as Mrs. Riganoff. The prisoners filed along toward the rear door of the night court with an air of dispirited defiance, bedraggled drabs seemed up out of the city slums all except the last one. Dodd stared at her unbelievingly. She was swaggering along with her head up in the air and her hands in her pockets or a fur jacket that had cost plenty of money. She was slim and very young and she had bronze red hair and a pert tilted up nose. She looked like she knew just what she was doing and was very proud of herself for doing it. That last one, Dodd asked Meekins, watching her disappear through the door. I thought so too, said Meekins. The coat is worth six months of what you laughingly call my salary. But she wouldn't put it up for security and she hasn't got a dime cash on her. And besides, she told me to scram. What's her name? Tessie Schmaltz, she says. What's the charge? Soliciting. She must be dumber than hell. She talked back to a plainclothes man down in Kester Street, so of course he run her in. Riganoff coughed. She stops me too. Mrs. Riganoff shook him viciously. What? What? Wait, Dodd said. Wait now. What's this, Riganoff? That girl, Tessie Schmaltz, stopped you? Yes. I'm hurrying to make my speech, and she stops me and says, Wait a minute. And I say, I got no time, please, and start to walk away fast. And she stops me again and puts her fingers in my pocket to hold me like this. Riganoff poked two fingers in the breast pocket of his coat to illustrate and his voice trailed off into a mumble. He opened his mouth and shut it again carefully. Mrs. Riganoff grabbed his wrist and hauled his hand out of his pocket. Expertly, she opened his clenched fingers. A flat red stone gleamed with incredible fiery brilliance against the grime on his palm. Woo-wee, Meekin said with a reverent whisper. Mrs. Riganoff slapped her husband and then slapped him again harder. So, taking jewelry from no goods? No, Riganoff wailed. No, no, I didn't. I didn't even know it was there. Let me see it, said Dodd. Give, said Mrs. Riganoff. Riganoff handed the stone over. But I didn't know. She put it there when I don't know. I didn't. Liar, said Mrs. Riganoff, slapping him. Wait now, said Dodd quickly. What happened after she put her hand in your pocket? I knock it away, said Riganoff plaintively. I'm in a big hurry to make my speech. I don't say nothing else to her at all. And I don't even see her again until now. Honest. Is it real? Meekins asked in the same reverent whisper. Dodd nodded. Yeah. Get in there and pay her fine, quick. Meekins darted through the front door of the courtroom. Mrs. Riganoff pointed a finger. You keep? Keep this? Dodd asked, holding up the stone. It's no good. It's no good to take jewelry from bum girls. Mama, Riganoff pressed it. Mama, but she slapped him. Shut up. You come home. I fix you. She dragged him down the hall. Riganoff tried to hold back, wailing tearfully, but to no avail. Mrs. Riganoff hauled him through the door and out into the night. Part 2. Vanishing Redhead Meekins came out of the courtroom so fast his hat brim was blowing up in front. He stepped beside Dodd, skidding his heel on the damp tile. Listen, boss, Sam Rudolph is in there. He got the clerk to call her case first. Plead her guilty and paid her fine without batting an eye. They're coming now. Rudolph? Dodd repeated thoughtfully. What's he doing in a night police court? Meekins had no time to answer because Sam Rudolph and the girl with the bronze hair came out of the night court entrance and started down the hall. Hi, Sam, said Dodd, getting in their way. Sam Rudolph was a thin little man with a powder pigeon chest. He wore specially built-up shoes, but even they weren't enough to bring the crown of his carefully creased hat higher than the top button on Dodd's vest. He had a dark, shallowly sallow face and a voice so gratingly unpleasant that it was rumored judges gave him his many successful decisions just to keep him from having to listen to him any longer. He was a crack criminal attorney, with all that implied. The Bar Association had been following him around for years, but had never been able to catch up with him. He tilted his head back and scowled up at Dodd. Hmm. Oh, hello, Dodd. Busy now. Some other day. Wait a minute, said Dodd easily. You've got enough time for me to say a word or two to Tessie here, haven't you? No, said Rudolph, trying to get around him. But the girl with the bronze hair pulled back on his arm, anchoring him. She looked even better at close range. She had a clear tan skin and nice blue eyes. 
than she had opened very wide now in a burlesque imitation of a baby stare. Oh, let's talk to the nice man. You are a nice man, aren't you? Positively, said Dodd. Are you a reporter too? No, said Rudolph sharply. He's a bail bondsman. Come along. The girl still dragged back. But I want to see a reporter. I thought there were always reporters in courtrooms to take your pictures and things. This is night court, Tessie, Dodd said. But you can talk to me. I talk to easily, even if I don't carry a camera. Rudolph put his hand against Dodd's chest and shoved. Now listen here, Dodd. You stop annoying my client. I'm in a hurry. Outside in the street, there was a sharp cracking report that multiplied itself in fluttering echoes. Instantly after it, there was another. Shots, Meekin exclaimed. He darted for the front door with Dodd, pounding heavily right behind him. They stopped for a second on the wet granite steps, staring both ways through the mist. There, Meekin said, pointing to the left. A tavern occupied the corner a half block away, light showing orange and dim through its painted windows. Its front door was open now, swung wide, and a man lay flat in the sidewalk in the column of light that splashed through it. Hey, said Meekin. That, that looks like... It's Reganoff, Dodd said. He went down the steps in long, awkward steps, skidded dangerously on the smeared sidewalk, and then hunched his broad shoulders forward and ran for the corner. Several of the saloon's customers had their heads poked cautiously out the door now, looking at the sprawled body on the sidewalk with stupid curiosity. Reganoff lay half-twisted on his side, as though he had started to turn and got his legs tangled in the process. One arm was out limp beside him, and the other was across his eyes, hiding his face. Dodd knelt down beside him, swearing in a whisper. Gently he moved the arm that covered Reganov's face. All the animation seemed to have fled from it, and it was stiff as wax. There was a deep slash cut over the eyes, and the nose was flattened and slewed sideways. Blood mixed with rain ran messily down both Reganov's sallow cheeks. Mrs. Riganoff appeared silently and ponderously out of the wet darkness. She shoved at the tavern customers that had ventured outside to form a ring around Dodd and Riganoff, knocking several of them inside. Get out! You get out! She knelt beside Dodd and put one square, muscle-padded hand softly on her husband's shoulder. He is dead? No, said Dodd. He's been knocked around plenty, but I can't find where any shots they don't shoot at him. They shoot at me. Around the corner, a siren sounded in a long, dismal wail. Dodd stared at Mrs. Riganoff. Her smooth face was impassive as ever, but her eyes were all green now, as round and luminous as a cat's. You? said Dodd. Yes. I leave him here while I go inside to get a beer. He cannot have a beer because he makes speeches after I tell him no. Two men come and hit him on the head and knock him down. I run out and chase them. They shoot at me. She touched a long rip in her overcoat, waist high on the left side, and shrugged indifferently. They don't shoot so good, but they run good. The ambulance on call at the police station whipped around the corner, skittering wildly on the wet asphalt, and bore down on them with a the siren still wide open. Meekins was standing on the running board, holding on to the doorpost with one hand and the brim of his hat with the other. He hopped off when the ambulance pulled into the curb. Is a little screwball dead? He asked anxiously. No, said Dodd. A couple of birds hammered him around with brass knucks. Got a concussion, I think. The ambulance attendants were handling Riganov's limp body with expert precision. They lifted him quickly and gently on a rolling stretcher. Mrs. Riganov stood silent and impassive watching them. Dodd pulled out her sleeve. Did you recognize the birds that hit him? No, I not see good. I find, though. What, said Dodd. I find, said Mrs. Riganoff. Nobody hits my husband but me. Nobody. I find. She nodded her head once at Dodd and climbed into the back of the ambulance with her husband. Dodd leaned in and called to the attendant. Doc, give him a private room and the trimming. It's on me. Okay, Dodd. Roll her, Casey. The back door slammed shut and the ambulance bored away into the night, with other things rising how from the siren. Dodd suddenly remembered Sam Rudolph and the girl with the bronze red hair. He turned hurriedly to go back to the courthouse and nearly fell over Meekins. They beat it, Meekins said. 
divining the cause of Dodd's sudden move. Rudolph had that green locomotive of his parked in front of the courthouse. She got in it with him and they went off in a cloud of smoke. Dodd squinted thoughtfully through the moisture that smeared the lenses of his patch glasses. You think them two birds were after that red rock Riganoff had? Meekins murmured. Maybe, Dodd said. You sure it's real? I didn't get a good squint at it. It's real. I can't tell whether it's flawed or not. Without a glass, but it's a small job of cutting. Ruby? Yeah. Boy, oh boy, said Meekins. Oh boy. Do you suppose the dame really slipped it to Riganoff, like he said? Dodd nodded. Yes. He wouldn't have tried to sell his wife such a goofy story if it hadn't been true. Anyway, you could tell from his face that he didn't know it was in his pocket until he reached in there. Do you suppose, said Meekins, that the dame has any more like that? Do you suppose she'd maybe hand us over half a dozen or so if we asked her pretty? I'd like to know, Dodds, it said. And me, said Meekins, and how. Hey, look. When I ducked through the station on the way to get to that ambulance, I spotted a dame that might give us some business. Want to see her? Yes, I'd like to find Rudolph and Tessie Smaltz, but there isn't much chance of that if he wants to keep her under cover. He's got too many hideouts. They walked across the street and diagonally across the small park south of the courthouse. Behind them, a radio car rolled up in front of the tavern. Remind me, I got to make a report on that as an eyewitness, Meekin said, I told the boys I would when I flagged the ambulance through. You better too. I didn't want Riganoff lying there on the sidewalk until them dopey cops got through with their Pinoche games and got around to answering the call. All right, said Dodd absently. Meekins jerked at his silk hat brim. Gee, you finally did cash in on that little screwball, didn't you? I couldn't figure why you was always fronting for him for no dough. I wasn't trying to cash in on him, Dodd said shortly. I like him. He's a harmless little devil, good-hearted as the day is long, even if he does have nitwitted ideas. I didn't want to see him get thrown in jail and lose his job. All right, all right, Megan said soothingly, but I'd sure hate to be the bird that pasted him. I wouldn't want that wife of his on my tail. Them eyes of hers give me the assorted shivers. They went around the back of the courthouse, and along a dimly lighted alley and across the paved court towards the green light that marked the side entrance of the police station. In here, said Meekins. Dot preceded him through the door and down the grimy, still smelling hall, past the deserted press room. The sergeant in charge was the only officer present in the booking room. He had his elbows on his desk and was looking wearily at the girl who stood on the other side of the wooden railing in front of it. Well, really, she was saying in a clear, arrogant voice, it doesn't seem to me that you can be very intelligent. Oh, I'm hellishly intelligent, the sergeant said. All us cops are. The girl was slim and tall and young. She wore a close-fitting blue tailored coat with a high fur collar. Her hair was blue-black, cut in a long page boy bob, glistening sleekly with moisture now, and her eyelashes were long and languorous over sleepily dark eyes. She was staring at the sergeant as though he were some form of lower animal life. It's a plain question, she said. Surely you can answer it if you want to try. The sergeant shook his head sadly. Look, lady, I sit here eight hours a day doing nothing but booking people in. How can I remember what one particular dame looks like? You could remember this one. She looks very refined, and she has red hair. Red hair, the sergeant said slowly. Refined. Sorry, lady. It don't mean a thing. Hello, Dodd. Dodd nodded to the girl and said, Perhaps I can help you. You were looking for a girl with red hair? She had tilted her head back to stare up at him. And just who are you, may I ask? I forgot, said the sergeant. Pardon me. She don't speak to strange men without a proper introduction. If you'll allow me, lady, I'll present you to Mr. William Dodd. Are you a reporter? She asked Dodd flatly. No, lady, the sergeant answered for him. He's a bail bondsman. That's a brand of vermin that infests police stations. We can't get rid of them. We tried fly spray and rat poison and whatnot, but they're a hardy breed. Dodd smiled at her. You were looking for a girl with red hair? Was she wearing a short mink jacket? She was suddenly here. Did you see her? Dodd shrugged. Maybe. What's her name? That's none of your business. Oh, said Dodd. Well, I guess I haven't seen her then. You have. You're lying. 
"'You're probably right, lady,' said the sergeant. "'Do you want to bet on it, Meekins?' "'The hell with you,' said Meekins. "'You want enough of my dough.' The sergeant rubbed his hands. "'That reminds me, Meekins, my friend. "'There was a little matter of two dollars on that fight last night.' "'Collect from Dodd,' Meekins said glumly. "'He owes me last week's salary.' The dark-haired girl stamped one small, high-heeled pump. "'You, all of you, answer my questions.' "'Well now,' said Dodd blandly, "'if you'd only tell me your friend's name, "'perhaps I could tell you if I'd seen her.' "'I won't. It's none.' "'Running feet thumped along the hall. "'A young man came through the door "'and jerked to a breathless halt "'when he saw the girl. "'Donna!' he exclaimed, "'staring in bewilderment from Dodd "'to the sergeant to Meekins. "'I got here as soon as I could. What? "'What is it?' "'He was a young man with a finely drawn pale face.' He was wearing a long blue overcoat with velvet lapels over a dinner jacket. He took off his black felt hat, now and brushed absently at the moisture on the brim, watching with worried eyes. The girl took him by the arm, pulled him into the far corner of the room, and whispered urgently in his ear. Don and Meekins and the sergeant watched curiously. The young man had white, thinly nervous hands, and he kept jerking them in subdued gestures of protest as the girl whispered to him. Finally, she finished and gave a little push in the direction of the railing. But Donna, he protested, I can't. The girl nodded, her sleek, dark hair determinedly. You do it. He shrugged and came up to the railing and spoke to the sergeant. I'd like to inquire whether or not a girl has been booked here tonight. Name? The sergeant asked, interested now. The man made a helpless gesture. I don't know her name. I can give you a description. If it's the same one she gave me, the sergeant said, jerking his head to indicate the darker girl. I already told her at least a hundred times. I don't know who you mean. The young man drew in his breath. I'm an attorney, Sergeant, and the girl in question is my client. I have a right to know whether or not she's being held here and the charge. Attorney, said the Sergeant. What's your name? Howard Linden. Dodd looked at Meekins and nodded. Meekins went quietly back along the hall to the press room, and Dodd could hear him dialing on one of the telephones there. Look, Mr. Linden, said the sergeant, I'm not trying to put anything over on anybody. I don't remember anybody like the lady describes, but that doesn't mean she ain't been here. If you give me her name, I could look it up, but if you don't, I can't. There's been about a hundred prisoners in here tonight. Some of them are still here and some of them went through night court already and some are going through now. If you wanna, you can inquire over there. Linden nodded. Thanks, he turned to the girl. That's the best to do, Donna. It's no good staying here. The girl pointed at Dodd. He knows. Do you? Linden asked. Dodd shrugged and smiled blandly. Offer him money, you fool, the girl said. Dodd smiled more broadly. No. You tell me the girl's name, and I'll tell you whether I've seen her or not. Linden turned to the dark-haired girl. Donna, can't I? No! Then no sale, said Dodd. Linden looked around helplessly and then said, Come on, Donna, perhaps at the night court. She let him lead her out, turning for one less arrogantly angry stare at Dodd. Meekins came in and said to Dodd, Lyndon is connected with McKay, Dunlop, and Riley, and they're hot-shot legal guys that handle corporate and financial stuff only. No court work. Lyndon ain't a partner or anything, just sort of a glorified office boy. Nothing much there, said Dodd. He and the brunette are evidently friends of the redhead. See if you can find out the brunette's last name. The first is Donna. I'll find out, said Meekins. Dodd knew he would, too. Meekins had weird and wonderful sources of information. What's all the gagging, the sergeant asked. We're trying to find out, Dodd answered. Look up Tessie Smaltz and see what address she gave when she was booked. Oh, is that who they were after? The sergeant said, pawing through an index. Why the hell didn't you tell him? I didn't want to, Dot said. I've got a reason. Here, said the sergeant. She gave her dress as 3716 West 45th. Dummy, said Meekins. There ain't no such number. 45th and in the 3400 block. Oh, hell, the sergeant exclaimed. That's right. Dodd shrugged. Well, that's that. Let's go over to night court, Meekins. They might dig something out of the clerk over there, and maybe we can tag along. Meekins nodded at the sergeant. Tell the boys in car 12 I'll make out an eyewitness statement before I leave tonight. You damn well better, smarty, the sergeant told him. 
or you won't leave for very long. And don't forget that two dollars. Part three, Gus Gillen, gambler. Meekins and Dodd came in through the back door of the courthouse and walked around the turn in the quarter in time to see Howard Linden and the girl called Donna coming out of the entrance of the night court. She was talking to him with a sort of angry disgust and her voice carried plainly. Well, you did it and you should have had better sense. The idea of telling a person a thing like that. But Donna, Linden protested, I don't know. I didn't think. I suppose, of course, she knew. You're a fool, Howard, Donna said shortly. Now, who is this man, Rudolph, the clerk told you about? He's a criminal attorney. He has a very shady reputation. How would he know her? Why should he pay her fine? Donna, I don't know. I haven't the faintest idea. Then we'll have to find him and ask. Come on. Without even looking in the direction of Dodd and Meekins, they went along the hall and out through the front entrance. They met a man at the white doors and he stepped aside quietly to let them pass. They didn't notice him. Meekins nudged Dodd. They're going to have one hell of a time finding Rudolph if we don't want them to. Rudolph is... He let his voice trail off, staring. What? Dodd asked. Meekins moistened his lips. That guy there, that's Gus Gillen. The man Donna and Lyndon had passed in the doorway was coming down the hall now. He was short and pudgy and he had a round face that was pink as a baby's. He wore a shiny blue suit that didn't fit him very well and was spotted on the shoulders with raindrops. He wore thick rimless spectacles and he had an amiable, shy smile. Who? Dot asked out of the corner of his mouth. Gus Gillen, Meeks whispered. Big shot from the west. Hangs out in Reno. Gillen came right on toward Dot and Meekins and stopped in front of them. He lowered his head a little to peer over the top of the thick glasses. You recognize me? He asked in an embarrassed tone. Yes, Dot admitted. If you're Gus Gillen, that is my name and yours. Dodd, I'm a bail bondsman. This is Meekins. He works for me. Dodd, Gillen repeated gently. Dodd, I remember. I came in tonight on a hurry-up trip. It's a private business, purely. I would rather it were not known I was here. Oh, said Dodd, noncommittally. You were watching the young couple who just went out. You're interested in them? After a fashion, said Dodd. A bail bondsman wouldn't be interested in them. No, said Dodd. Maybe I should say a bail bondsman shouldn't be interested in them. Gillen said, correcting himself. He was still smiling. We ain't interested in them. Meekin said quickly, not anymore, Mr. Gillen, not a bit. Dodd looked at him indignantly and was about to say something to Gillen when a man came around the curve in the corridor behind them and said, Hi, Dodd. Hi, Meekins. Say, listen, either of you two know anything ripe? about a gal with red hair and some rubies? His words echoed a little in the emptiness of the quarter, and after that the silence seemed to grow so heavy it was like a thick weight pressing down. Gillen was wearing yellow shoes with upturned toes, and he walked forward and back on them, making them squeak gently. Well, said the other man, do you? He was taller even than Dodd and much thinner, and he had a harassed air as though he had a lot of things to do and not enough time to do them. He was wearing a ragged raincoat, hung around his shoulders like a cape, and he held a blackened, stubby pipe in one corner of his mouth. Is it a riddle? Dot asked smoothly. Huh? No. Somebody called up and rooted me out of my evening siesta and told me to come down to the courthouse if I wanted something hot. I said I'd heard that one before, and they said to look for the red-headed girl with the rubies. I thought it was a rib at first, and then I got to thinking about it, so I trailed down here. It must have been a rib, said Dodd. Undoubtedly, said Meekins. The tall man was looking at Gus Gillen with a calculating squint in his eyes. Seems like I've seen you before somewhere, mister. Not in person, but your picture. Perhaps you have, said Gus Gillen gently. This is Mr. McRae, Dodd said to the tall man, indicating Gillen with a wave of his hand. Mr. McRae is a, a real estate broker from out of town. Mr. McRae, this is Donald Craig. He's a reporter on the Times. It's a pleasure to meet you, Gillen said politely. McRae, said Craig, real estate. That doesn't sound familiar. Must be you look like someone else. Dodd, are you sure you haven't seen any red-headed gals or rubies around here? Oh, no, said Dodd. Absolutely not, Meek in second. 
Was it a man or woman who called you? Dot asked. Woman, Craig answered. Sounded young, if that means anything. That's why I thought it was a gag. I thought it was some chorus biddy looking for publicity. Is that all she said? Dot inquired. Yeah, but somebody called right afterwards and said, Who's this? And I said, It's the Times, if it's all the same to you. And they hung up on me without another peep. The funny thing was, though, that on both calls, there was music playing in the background, and it was the same piece. Damn funny music, too. It sounded like somebody playing swing on a fire siren. Meekins made a strangling noise in his throat, and Dodd said hastily, It certainly is wonderful the things people will do for a gag these days. Yeah, Craig, says sourly. Very wonderful indeed. If I catch pneumonia, I'll laugh myself to death. Well, I'll dodge into night court and see what gives. So long. He went through the back door of the night court and left Dodd and Meekins looking at Gillen. Thank you very much, Mr. Dodd, Gillen said shyly, for not revealing my identity. If you'll excuse me now, I'll go into the court too. I find night sessions very instructive and stimulating. Oh, very, Dodd agreed vaguely. He watched Gillen until he had disappeared through the front entrance of the court and then turned on Meekins. Well, why the funny noises? Meekins looked like he had been holding his breath. What well, Craig said, that the music sounded like a swing played on a fire siren. A couple of weeks ago, we pulled a guy named Windy Moore out of the pokey when he was in for getting on a marijuana jag. This Moore's an entertainer. He plays pieces by blowing up an inner tube and letting the air come out through a rubber squeegee on the valve. I heard him. It sounds like a fire siren. He's playing now as Shine Bravani's clip joint on Clark, just off Kester. Well, said Dodd thoughtfully, on Clark off Kester, huh? And the red-headed doll was picked up on Kester. Listen, boss, said Meekins earnestly, I think we better take that red rock and get ourselves undercover somewhere, real far undercover. How so, Dodd asked him, White. Look, said Meekins, Reganoff got battered around with brass knucks on account of that ruby, and that's all right. I'll fight with them nucks for a purse like that any day. But I don't want any part of Gillen or Shine Bravani. I'm curious, Dodd told him. Here's a nice looking girl hanging out on Custer Street, giving strange guys rubies and getting hauled up for soliciting and getting Sam Rudolph to front for her. I want to know why. I don't, said Meekins. Don't let that mild air of Gillen's fool you. He's big time in the gambling racket in Nevada, and he's got his fist and lots of other things. I hear tell. And not only that, but he knows a hundred guys who'd just as leave rub you as spit. And Shine Bravani is just naturally bad from way back. I positively don't want to get in between him and Gillen. I think I'll look around, Dodd decided, ignoring him. Where? On Custer Street. What plainclothes men picked the redhead up? Harris. You can catch him in the back room of Casey's Haven. He ducks in for a drink every hour or so, but listen, boss, if I were you, you aren't, so don't let it worry you. You get to work and find out what Donna's last name is and anything else you can pick up in a hurry. Call me at Casey's Haven. I'll call you, Meekin agreed gloomily, but I don't know as you'll hear me. Part 4. Old Smoke Don came in through the swinging green doors of Casey's Haven and breasted a solid wave of noise that beat up unavailingly against the low ceiling. The longshoremen and dock workers, heavily muscled men with bigger voices and big thirsts, were crowded three deep along the bar and clouds of rank tobacco smoke swooped and swirled crazily over their heads. Dodd stepped over a red-faced man who was squatting on the floor, pounding on the bottom of a brass spittoon with an empty beer bottle and howling some queerly rhythmic dirge. He worked his way through the press to the hinge gate at the end of the bar. Casey himself was there, sitting on a spindle leg stool and looking wearily philosophical about it all. How's it going, Casey? Dot asked. You can look around this madhouse and ask that, Casey said. How many fights tonight? Six, not counting a political argument. I'm looking for Harris. Have you seen him? Casey stared up at the cracked dial of the clock over the back bar. He'll be here any minute. Your man, Meekins, wants you to call him at the police station. Thanks. Fix me a rye highball. Dodd pushed through to the phone booth in the corner, got the police operator, the booking sergeant, and finally Meekins. Well, what? he asked. Hot stuff, Meekins said. 
Sam Rudolph had an argument about the right of way with a lamp post over on Center Street. They had to scrape his car off the pavement. How about the redhead? Dodd demanded. She wasn't with him. Sam's got two crack ribs and a couple of black eyes, and he isn't talking very much. He said he skidded, but that's hard to figure because it happened in the middle of a block, and there wasn't any traffic. I think the dame decided not to go any further with him and just gave the wheel a jerk and steered him into the lamppost and then beat it. Probably, Dodd agreed. Anything else? I always save the best for the last. Donna's last name is Barstow, and her old man is E.P. Barstow, and he's a heavy market operator in mining stock. I found that out from Craig. So then I called up the Barstow joint and gave somebody a little song and dance about being a society reporter, and then somebody tells me that Miss Donna Barstow is home on vacation from Miss Wiggenbottom's seminary for girls. And guess this. She has, as her guest, during the vacation, another student from the same school. Her roommate by the name of Patricia Gilwin. And this Patricia Gilwin has very beautiful auburn hair. Ah, said Dodd triumphantly. Good work. I always deliver, Meekin said modestly. Call me back if you get anything else. Dodd went back to the end of the bar. Casey has set out two drinks. He pointed to one and said, This is yours. Harris is in the back room now. You can take the other one to him. Dodd paid for the two drinks and took them with him, though, through the rear door of the saloon and down a narrow, dark hall to another door that was marked Private No Admittance. This means you, in large red letters. He opened the door, maneuvered himself and the drinks through and kicked it shut behind him. Hello, Harris, he said. Have a drink with me? That I will, said Harris heartily. He was a tall, enormously broad man with a red square face and blue eyes that had little white laughter lines at the corner. He took the drink from Dodd, threw it down with one big gulp and waited for it to hit bottom. Ah, he said in a satisfied tone when it did. There's nothing like good Irish whiskey. Damn all water, I say, and especially when it's rained. How are you, Dodd? Good enough, said Dodd, and expecting to be better shortly. I hope I want to ask you a question. Do you remember a red-headed girl who gave her name as Tessie Smaltz? You picked her up tonight earlier. Huh, Harris grunted. Do I remember her? Are you going to use that drink of yours, or are you just going to sit and hold it? Take it, Don invited. It's right. Better than nothing, Harris said, pouring it after the first one. Tessie Smaltz, huh? Sure, I remember her. I spotted her over near Clark, and I thought... She'd be one to watch on account of the coat she was wearing. You see, I used to work on the loft squad, and I know Mink when I see it, and there's others around here who do too, but not for the same reason. So I thought she'd wind up in an alley with a sore head and no coat to cover her if I didn't keep an eye open. And then what do I find but that little tart is going along hitting guys up on Kester. And then, Dot urged. So I stop her and I say, Listen, cutie, Run yourself home to your mama before I sick the truant officer on you. Ha! Huh. And what did she say? She said, Listen, ape face, I'll do what I damn please and walk where I damn please. So I say, No, you won't, my dear. You'll ride to the station. I was just bluffing, hoping it would scare her, but she laughed at my face, so I had to send her along. She was a crazy one, but then the young ones are all crazy now. She had no eye for prospects, I'll say that. She hit up two of the worst you could find if you sifted this town like sand. Only two? Dot asked casually. Yep. One was Riganoff, that screechy little crackpot who has a wife that would cut his ears off if he looked at another woman, and the other was Old Smoke. Old Smoke? Dot repeated. Harris laughed. That old stew bum. He'd rather look into a glass of whiskey than into the eyes of any woman that ever lived. Where could I find him? Dot asked. Old Smoke, he lives in a shack on Butcher Flats, a little spit that sticks out just south of Crane's packing house. He'll be drunk by this time, stiffer than a log. Dodd stood up. I'll take a look. Harris pointed a thick forefinger. Watch your step, my boy, down that way. It's one of our most exclusive neighborhoods. Exclusively bad. The taxi bounced over Culvert with a sideways twist that made the springs groan protestingly and pulled up to a stop under the feeble yellow glow of a street light. We're at the end of the line, Doc, the driver said. This here's a taxi, not an ocean liner. Dodd got out and paid him. 
I won't be long. Will you wait for me? Doc, the driver told him. In this neighborhood at this time of night, I wouldn't wait five minutes for the King of England. There's guys around here that will cut your throat for a dime. And I mean ten cents. All right, Dodd said. He started down the slanting, slick cobblestones. Behind him, the taxi's motor made a fluttering blast as it backed and turned hurriedly. It banged back over the culvert, and then the sound of its motor faded smoothly into the distance. It had stopped raining, but there was a yellow moving mist in the air that felt slickly smooth against Dodd's face. There were warehouses all around him, great blocks of them hunched in squat darkness. Somewhere close ahead, water slapped monotonously against the piling, and the sour salt smell of the bay floated heavily in the mist. Dodd came to a corner under the feeble yellow eye of another street light. He turned around very quickly there and ducked down, a little staring up the slant of the street. He caught the dim sway of a figure outlined for a second against the first street light. It was gone instantly and it didn't appear again. Dodd swore to himself in a whisper. The sound of the slapping water was closer and he walked in front of a warehouse on planks that were ground to rough splinters by the constant wear of the iron wheels of hand trucks. A red light on a boy dipped and swayed tipsily, making ruddy, gleaming streaks on the greasy surface of the bay. Dodd went on past the warehouse and ducked into a velvet black niche between it and the next one. He stood flat against the wall there waiting. A boat whistle sounded low and dull off somewhere in the night. Footsteps touched the splintered planks and came along in a quick, stealthy shuffle. Dodd could hear the man breathing before he saw him and then he was just a dark bent outline. Waiting until he was even with a niche, Dodd stepped out behind and slid his right arm across in front of the man's throat. Ha, the man said in a sudden shrill gasp that ended when Dodd tightened his arm and bent slightly sideways, pulling the man against him and bending him backwards across Dodd's outthrust hip. The man fought, clutching desperately with both hands, trying to kick back at Dodd's shin. Quit it, Dodd said, or I'll crack your neck. The man relaxed instantly with a choke gurgling noise. Dodd relaxed his stranglehold slightly, and the man sucked in air with a wheezy sob. Let go, let go me. I didn't. I wasn't. Oh, hell, said Dodd in a disgusted tone. He released the man and gave him a shove. So it's you, is it? He found the match in his pocket, snapped it on his thumbnail, and held it in front of his own face. Ha, Dodd! Yeah, I didn't think... I'd see you again, Maxie, once you owe me ten bucks. Haven't you got it on you, have you? The man's voice dropped into an accustomed whine. I'm just dead broke, Dodd. Honest. I ain't got enough to eat, even. That certainly isn't food I smell on your breath, Dodd agreed. So you've taken to rolling lushes now, have you, Maxie? Better watch your step. One more trip of, and they'll throw the book at you. I got to have something to eat. Ever think of working? I can't get no job, Dodd. Them cops keep after me all the time, persecuting me and hounding me. I ain't got a place I can turn, and I ain't got a friend. Too bad, too bad, said Dodd unfeelingly. You should write a letter to the governor about it. Only, don't forget to tell him you had, you had three jobs since you got paroled the last time and lost them all because you couldn't keep your mitts out of the cash register. But never mind that. Where does old smoke live from here? Down the next block and through that alley toward the bay. What's everybody want that old stew bump for? What do you mean, everybody? There was a guy after him earlier. How do you know? Try to stick him up? No, I never did. I just asked him for a match and he stuck a gun right in me. He was a reporter, he says, name of Craig, and he wanted to interview Old Smoke. I say it's a hell of a fine note for reporters to stick guns in people. If it was Craig... It was probably just a pipe. A pipe? No, it wasn't no pipe. I know a gun when I see it. And that's what this was he stuck in me. He ain't got no right to stick a gun in a person just because a person asked him polite for a match. You don't seem to be having very good luck tonight. Don't follow me around any longer because I might get mad. Sure not, Dodd. Say, could you maybe spare four bits for an old pal that ain't had a bite to eat for three days? Just four bits, huh, Dodd? I'll pay you back next week. Dodd gave him a coin. All right, all right. But when you get picked up drunk tonight, don't holler for me to go your bail because I'm not going to. Thanks. Thanks, pal. I ain't drinking no more. No, sir. 
I turned over a new leaf. Dot, thanks. Scram. Sure, Dot, sure. Thanks. I'll pay you back next week. Honest, so long. Dot stood and watched the bench shuffling figure until it went under the yellow circle of the streetlight and turned up the block. He shrugged then and turned around and went past the next warehouse and across a narrow cobblestone alleyway. The shoreline turned a little here and there were warehouses on both sides of Dot again. He went along in between them, accompanied by the hollow empty sound of his footsteps until he saw a blackened notch in the solid walls. Dodd turned into it, slowing up. The ground softened and his feet crunched on soggy refuse. He went on, feeling his way with one hand against the rough stone of a wall, and suddenly the alley opened out and he almost fell into a pond of scum stagnant water. He stopped, squinting ahead through the mist and made out the shadowy blur of a shack straight ahead. Ten feet to his right, there was a long board stretched across the pond. Dodd tested the board with his foot gingerly and then walked quickly across it, balancing himself with his arm extended wide. The board slapped the water under him, groaning with his weight. He jumped the last five feet and landed in mud that sucked hungrily when he pulled his feet free. The shack was directly ahead of him, a sagging, paddleless pile of battered odds and ends of lumber that had been salvaged from the bay. One window on the wall on Dodd's side stared like a bleary, blinded eye. Smoke, Dodd called. Old smoke! His voice bounced off the warehouse walls and echoed flat and empty across the water. There was no answer. Dodd walked around the shack, his feet sloppily wet in the mud, and found what served as a door. He pounded on it and shouted again, Hey, smoke! There was no answer, and Dodd muttered disgustedly to himself, Must be drunker than an owl. He put his weight against the door and pushed. The hinges groaned deloriously and the bottom scraped against the rough boards. Putting his head inside, Dodd breathed in stale air loaded with the odors of sweat and burned grease and alcohol. Dodd struck a match in the wall, and the flames sputtered up yellow and wavering and showed a blurred, impressionistic picture of the cave-like interior of the shack. It was like a medieval horror painting, with a wasted form of old smoke lying on the soiled mattress in the corner, spread eagled there with his arms flung wide and his eyes staring glassily at the ceiling. There was a round black hole punched in the skinny muscle of his neck just under the angle of his stubbled beard and the blood had seeped down and soaked into the blanket that was twisted under him. Dodd stood there frozen until the match burned his finger. He dropped it then and lighted another breathing heavily. The blood had turned the blanket into a purple clotted mass. Dodd stepped closer forcing himself to hold the match steady and saw that every one of Old Smoke's pockets had been turned inside out. The match went out, and he dropped it and found another, fumbling in his haste. He held this one high over his head, staring around the shack. The place was a filthy as pigsty, but it gave no evidence of having been searched. He found it, Dodd said in a whisper. He felt the cold moisture of perspiration on his face, and it was hard for him to breathe. Dodd stepped outside the shack, slamming the door shut behind him. He wiped the back of his hand across his forehead, staring blankly at the greasy water of the bay. Craig, he said slowly. Craig, hell. He jerked himself into motion then and dodged around the corner of the shack and trotted back to the board that bridged the stagnant pool. He wasn't so careful this time. He went across the board, taking long, hurried steps, and when he was in the middle of it, it cracked gently under him, slipping sideways and then turned. Dodd went up in the air and came down again, churning his arms and legs frantically. He hit the water with a hollow, dull splash and turned it into dirty froth. It was only knee-deep, but there was a foot of soft mud underneath it. Dodd staggered to his feet, cursing and spluttering. He fought his way through the mud to the edge of the pond. He was soaked through when the mud was thick and slimy on his face and hands. He fumbled with stiff fingers, still cursing monotonously, until he found his handkerchief. He made a damp, wadded ball out of it, and swabbed the mud out of his eyes. His patch glasses were floating placidly on the roiled water and he leaned over and groped until he got hold of them. He began to trot back through the alley, his trousers slapping wetly and uncomfortably against his legs. He turned out into the narrow street and back past the warehouse where he had tackled Maxie. He turned again under the street light and labored up the slant of the street to the intersection where he had left the taxi. His breath was beginning to burn his throat now his heart made pounding thunder. He kept at it, trotting steadily along with the water squishing in his shoes. 
heading back toward the blurred color smear of lights that marked the downtown section of the city. It was 15 minutes later, and he was staggering a numb sticks of legs that had no feeling and no give at the knees when he came out on a wider street and saw the red and green lights of a cruising taxi a half block away. Dodd had just enough breath left to whistle. He put his finger in his mouth and did the best he could. The taxi kept on going, floating tantalizingly away from him, and Dodd collapsed on the curb. He was all through. He didn't have energy enough to swear, but he began to think dizzily of the things he was going to say when he did. Then the taxi slid up and stopped beside him, and the driver said without much hope, Taxi, mister? Dodd got up, grabbed the door handle before he could get away again. Aragon Apartments, he managed to gasp. Hey, listen, the driver protested. You're all full of mud. You're going to get my cushions all smeared. All right, all right, Dodd panted. I'll sit on the floor and pay double the meter. Just get going. I want a bath, and I want one right now. Part 5. Rubies and a Redhead The Aragon Apartments had a small, austerely correct lobby, but there was no desk in it, and it was late enough now so that all the tenants had retired to their respective apartments, if not to bed. Dodd was glad enough to have no audience. He went across the lobby in a hurry, still trailing ribbles of muddy water behind him, and took the self-operated elevator to the third floor. He went down the long hall, still hurrying, fumbling with wet, muddy fingers for his key ring. He fitted the key in the lock of the door of his own apartment, but it wouldn't turn. His fingers slipped off at once and then again. He swore in an undertone and wiped his hand on his coat, smearing his fingers more than before. He tackled the key again, and this time the door opened of its own accord, and left him standing there, staring incredulously. Craig, the reporter, was sitting in the big chair under the crooked neck bridge lamp. He was sitting there, very still, looking awkward and gaunt and uncomfortable, and he was watching Dodd with the eyes that were wide open and that didn't blink. Dodd said, well, and then didn't finish the sentence. Craig's stubby pipe had fallen from his mouth. It was lying in his lap and the ashes in it had spilled a gray streak across one trouser leg. There was a hole like an oversized black period in the center of Craig's forehead. Not very much blood had come out of it. Dodd released his breath in a long sigh. He stepped into the apartment and closed the door quietly and firmly behind him. He stood there for a moment, staring incredulously, and then stepped closer. Yeah, a voice told him. He's still here. Dodd spun on his heel. There was a man standing in the open doorway of the bedroom. He was a small man with a face as pale and shiny as old parchment, and his eyes were flat and deadly close on either side of the swollen, formless bulge of his nose. He was wearing a pearl gray derby, the crown spattered with raindrops, and a greenish pinstripe suit. He was holding a forty-five automatic that looked grotesquely huge and deadly clasped in his thin hand. He nodded gravely and said, Hi, Dodd. Dodd moistened his lips. Hello, Luke. I didn't know you were back. I thought this town was too hot for you. Not anymore, said Luke. Shine Bravani is taking care of me now. He wants to see you. Does he? Dodd asked absently. The front door of the apartment opened and another man slipped inside. He was squat and bow-legged with long muscular arms out of proportion to the rest of him. His eyes were shifting colorless little pinpoints under glove-scarred brows, and his left ear was bent over and blackened. Well, said Dodd. Shine sent a regular greeting committee, didn't he? Hello, Mushy. Mushy lifted his rubbery, thickened upper lip in a leering half smile. Yeah, he said in a whispering croak. Go over him, Luke ordered. Mushy slid around behind Dodd and slapped his pockets with a quick, deft hand. No gun, Luke. That's why he went out, Luke said. He was ditching it. But what I want to know is where? Where, Dodd? Where what? Dodd asked. The gun. Where'd you put it? What gun? Luke jerked his head toward Craig. Dodd grinned wryly. Hell, you're not trying to talk me into thinking I killed Craig, are you? That's the kind of stuff you go in for, Luke. I had you tagged for the job. I was afraid maybe you had, Luke said softly. Take another look at his pockets, Mushy. Careful this time. Mushy went through Dodd's clothes with the expert position of a pickpocket and found the ruby in Dodd's lower vest pocket. Yeah, he said triumphantly, showing it to Luke. Luke watched Dodd silently for a moment and said, We'll go see Bravani. We got a car downstairs. You want to walk to it or do you want to be carried? You'll frighten me if you don't watch out, Dodd answered, but I'll walk. I'm hardly wearing the proper dress, though, to appear in such a Tony Dibes shine runs these days. You might look worse later, Duke told him. 
It was a small black sedan, a new one and indistinguishable from thousands of others that had come off the assembly line before and after it. Mushy was driving and Dodd was sitting in the back seat with Luke. Luke wasn't holding the forty-five on Dodd. He had it deposited casually in his lap and apparently he wasn't even looking at Dodd. But Dodd knew that he was watching out of the corners of his eyes, waiting for Dodd to make a move. Luke was an old hand at this and Dodd sat carefully still. Mushy turned the sedan off Clark into a narrow alley and coasted along it slowly until he came to a board fence that barred the end. He stopped there and Luke picked up the automatic and said, Out, Dodd, and don't try to be funny. I'm fresh out of jokes, Dodd said. He opened the door and stepped down on the rough paving. Luke slid out behind him. Mushy used the key to open a padlock on a gate in the board fence. He preceded Dodd and Luke through the gate, closed it behind them, and then led the way around the corner of a building and across a small backyard to a door in the rear of another building. Servant's entrance, Dodd asked. Luke said, just keep the trap shut. Mushy opened the door and the three of them went into a long, dimly lighted hall. When Mushy closed the door, Dodd could hear the faint clatter of plates and tinkle of silverware. At the back of the hall, a narrow carpeted stairway led up to the second story, and Dodd climbed the steps with Mushy ahead of him and Luke close behind. There was another closed door at the top of the stairs, and Mushy scraped lightly on its panel with his thumbnail and then turned the knob. In said Luke, pushing Dodd with the automatic. Dodd stepped into Shine Bravani's private office. It was a small square room, its one window masked with heavy black drapes. The big flat desk in the center filled up most of the floor space, and Shine Bravani was sitting on a corner of it, casually swinging one leg back and forth. Shine Bravani took his name from his hair. It was so black it looked purple in streaks along the top where the light caught it. It was so heavy with grease that it didn't look like hair at all, but a flat, viscous mat curved sleekly over the bony outline of his skull. He had a long, sallow face and a mouth that was pursed, colorless line. He was dressed very dapperly in a navy blue tuxedo, and he wore patent leather shoes and gray spats. He looked at Dodd and waved one hand languidly. Over there. Mushy put his hand in the center of Dodd's chest and shoved him hard. Dodd stammered backwards and his knees hit the edge of a chair. He sat down in it with a thump. Shine Bravani turned his head back again and continued to stare thoughtfully at the girl with the red bronze hair. She was sitting in a chair beside the desk and she didn't look proud or confident anymore. She looked scared, but still defiant. She was holding her hands clasped tightly together in her lap. Luke still had the big forty-five clasped casually in his right hand and he stepped into the center of the room where he could watch Dodd without turning his head. Where'd you get her? He asked Bravani. She just walked in, Bravani explained, right after you left. So I brought her up here to have a chat. So far we haven't been getting on too well. All right, cutie, once again, what's the big idea? The girl's lip were pressed into a determined line and she shook her head stubbornly. Bravani leaned forward and slapped in the face, hard. Her head jerked sideways with the impact and her blue eyes widened with a sort of unbelieving terror. Speak up, cutie, Bravani said. Slap her again and you'll have a one-man ride around here, Dodd said flatly. Mushy was standing beside his chair. He brought his fist out of the sagging pocket of his coat now. He was wearing a set of brass knuckles and he slashed downward at Dodd's face with him. Dodd jerked his head aside and the brass knuckles struck his shoulder with a force that numbed his whole side. Luke raised the forty-five automatic and leveled the heavy barrel at Dodd's chest. Never hit a man with glasses on, Mushy, Bravani advised gently. You know that's against the law. Mushy grinned and flicked out the stiffened finger of his left hand, knocking Dodd's patched glasses on the floor. He raised his right fist in a glinting art, aiming more carefully this time. Oh, don't, the girl gasped in a sickened whisper. Dodd stared at Bravani, blinking a little. What I said still goes. I can take it. I hope you can when it gets around to your turn. He means it, Luke said. He don't scare very easy, or maybe he's only nuts. Cut it, Mushy, Bravani said. So, you thinking we're going to get a turn, right, Dodd? You'll want bail sometime. Bravani laughed contemptuously. You think we ask a two-bit operator like you for it? No matter who you ask, you won't get it. If I put the finger on you, bail bondsmen stick together. Bravani's face grew tight and still. 
Maybe you won't put the finger on anybody but a couple of fish at the bottom of the bay. Let's hear you do some talking. Ever see this before? Bravani picked up a round blue circle from the desk and flipped it at Dodd. Dodd bat at it nearsightedly, knocked it to the floor by his glasses. He leaned over and picked it up his glasses too. It was a poker chip and he turned it over in his fingers and saw the name Bravani printed in small golden letters on its back. He looked up. You still running games here? Two roulette tables and craps and a blackjack layout. Bravani said, but I asked you a question, Dodd. No, I've never seen this chip before, nor any other like it. I didn't even know you were running tables here now. He had one of the red rocks on him, Luke said. Give it to Shine, Mushy. Mushy handed Bravani the ruby he had taken from Dodd. Bravani turned it over in his fingers absently and then showed it to the girl. Yours, cutie? She nodded her head once, still holding her lips pressed tightly together. Where'd you get it? Bravani asked Dodd. From Riganov. She gave it to him. He gave it to me before Mushy clipped him. You might as well break down and tell me what this is all about, Shine. That's what I want to know, said Bravani. This doll comes in early this evening. She wants to see me, and when I let her, she asks me what I know about Gus Gillen. I know plenty about that baby-faced double-crossing rat, and I told her some of it. So she just sits and takes it without a peep and then says, thanks, goes over and sits by herself in a corner of the bar. I noticed when she talked to me that she's wearing this ruby and another one like it in a big dinner ring. I tell Mushy to keep an eye on her. So she borrows a nice pick from the bartender and starts taking these two rocks out of their setting. It's my ring, said the girl. It's my business what I did with it. Shut up, Bravani ordered. So Mushy can't figure that one out and he's too dumb to come and tell me. So the doll makes a phone call. Mushy does spot the number and calls it back and finds out she's talked to the Times. She beats it then, and Mushy comes and tells me. So I send him and Luke out to see what she's up to. She stops that little screwball, Riganov, and old smoke, and then she runs up against Harris, who pinches her. I knew that, Dodd said. Never mind what you knew. So Luke sees old smoke, you know where to pick up a snipe, and one of these rubies pops out of his pocket. Old smoke grabs it and rushes into a bar. Luke... And Mushy can't get him in there, so they uh, they come back. I called up Sam Rudolph and told him to get the doll out and find out what the hell eats her and send Luke and Mushy down to back his play. They say Riganoff and figure he's got the other rock and make a play for him and botch it. The doll gets loose from Sam. So Mushy and Luke went down to Old Smoke's joint and they find the old stew bum with a bullet in his gizzard. They find that blue chip from my joint lying on the floor beside him. So, said Dodd, so I'm in the middle here and I don't like it. Suppose the cops find old smoke croaked and that chip on the floor with my name on it. They come right back here and they find out about this red-headed doll and her rubies starting out from here. Then, where do we go? For a ride in the paddy wagon, said Dodd. He looks speculatively at Luke. So maybe you didn't knock Craig over? What? Bravani demanded sharply. Craig, said Luke, report from the Times, we found him in Dodd's apartment, deader than a kippered herring. Yes, said Dodd, and Craig was running a series of articles on vice and gambling in the city, wasn't he? Bravani came up off the desk as though something had stung him. He stood rigid for a second, staring hard at Dodd, and then sat down slowly. Again, he swore in a low, bitter monotone. That Gus Gillen, that damn backstabbing Gus Gillen. He glared at the red-headed girl. Listen, cutie, I got no more time to stall around with you. What's your name? Patricia Gilwin, Dodd said. The girl jerked her head around to look at him. Surprised, wiped away the lines of sullen defiance in her face as she looked round and soft and childish. You, Dodd blurted in amazement. Gilwin Gillen. You're some relation to Gus Gillen. You look like him. She drew a long tremulous breath. I'm his daughter. There was a dead tense silence and then Bravani said very softly, So? Gus Gillen's daughter. His daughter, huh? He slid off the desk. Then we'll just forget about the rubies. Yeah, they don't matter much. I've been looking for a chance like this. I owe Gus Gillen a thing or two. He stepped slowly closer to the girl and was grinning with a sort of savage, vindictive glee. Here, said Dot sharply. What? Bravani didn't turn his head. Take a mushy. Yeah, said Mushy thickly. He raised his brass-knuckled fist. Dodd 
stuck sideways, swinging both stiffened legs sideways, and knocked Mushy's feet out from under him. And in that same instant, the door latch made a soft click, and one of the hinges creaked a little. Dodd lunged forward, ignoring the menace of Luke's gun, and landed with both knees in the middle of Mushy's stomach. Mushy grunted in agony. He heaved up in an arc and threw Dodd off him, and as Dodd rolled away from him, he caught a hazily blurred picture of the rest of the room. Mrs. Riganoff was standing in the doorway. I find, said Mrs. Riganoff. Luke was spinning around, and as he turned, he fired with the big automatic. The blasting roar of the report filled the room, and Dodd saw the forty-five buck up in Luke's hand and saw the bullet rake a long, splintered gash in the doorpost. Mrs. Riganoff didn't seem to move fast. She raised her right hand. She was holding a flat iron in it. It was not an electric iron. It was an old-fashioned flat iron, an ugly wedge-shaped piece of solid metal, and Mrs. Riganoff threw it at Luke. Luke tried to dodge, but he was too close. The flat iron hit him in the face with a sound like a board slapping water and carried him clear across the room and smashed him into the wall. He dropped to the floor and didn't move. Mushy was up on his knees. He struck viciously at Dodd now with his brass knuckles. Dodd ducked the blow by falling flat on his face and then Mrs. Riganoff leaned over and clipped Mushy's neatly across the back of the neck with the hard edge of her palm. Mushy's head jerked and he seemed to come all unstrung. He flopped limply over on top of Dodd. Bravani had lunged clear over his desk and was frantically jerking at a drawer on the other side trying to get it open. Mrs. Riganoff got her hands around his thin neck picked them off the desk and slammed him headfirst into the wall. Bravani screamed shrilly. Mrs. Riganoff threw him back and slammed his head into the wall again, harder. Dodd was trying frantically to scramble out from under Mushy. Wait, he yelled, don't! Bravani screamed and Mrs. Riganoff slammed him into the wall again with methodical precision. Bravani quit screaming with horrible abruptness. Dodd kicked Mushy off him and got to his feet. He grabbed Mrs. Riganoff by one massive arm. Wait! You'll kill him! Sure, said Mrs. Riganoff. Wait! Dodd groped for an inspiration. Listen, if you kill him, I'll lose that money I put up for a peace bond for your husband. Oh, said Mrs. Riganoff. All right. I don't kill him. Now. She dropped Bravani and a limp sprawl on the floor and I, Patricia, was still sitting, stiffly terrorized in her chair. She's the one that starts this? No, no, said Dodd quickly. Oh, no. She didn't have anything to do with these others. She's a friend of mine. Hmm, said Mrs. Riganoff doubtfully. Positively, Dodd hastened to assure her. How'd you find these boys anyway? I ask. I ask every woman on this street. One sees them following this girl and knows they are Bravani men. I guess they don't beat my husband up no more. I'll bet they don't either, Dodd agreed emphatically. Part 6. The Blue Chip The taxi made a U-turn in the middle of the wide, tree-lined street, and rolled to a stop in front of an apartment house that was a massive, dark peak of a granite with high, needled spires on its four corners. Dodd got out and held the door open for Patricia Gilwin. She was still remembering the scene in Shine Bravani's office, and her face had a drawn, frightened look. Would would you come up with me, she asked, I'd like awfully to explain. Sure, said Dodd. The mud on his clothes had dried and stiffened now, and he crackled every time he moved. His shoulder ached and his glasses were twisted, at the patch so that one lens sat high and the other low, but he was feeling very pleased with himself, in spite of all that. He paid the driver, and he and Patricia were going up the steps of the apartment building when there was a long, high squeal of skidding tires behind them, and Donna Barstow's voice called, Pat! Patricia! She was driving a long maroon roadster, and Howard Linden was riding with her. They both got out of the car and hurried across the walk. Patricia, Donna said, We've been looking everywhere for you. I got the note you left for me saying you were going out to get yourself arrested, and I simply couldn't understand. She recognized Dodd under the mud and said instantly arrogant, And just what are you doing here? Patricia held out her hand pleadingly. Donna, please, he's my friend. He, he's been so decent and so kind. Donna accepted Dodd on that recommendation without the slightest hesitation. Oh, I don't know. I'm sorry. Now, Patricia, what in the world does all this mean? Patricia nodded toward Lyndon, who was fidgeting uneasily in the background. Didn't he tell you about about my father? He did, said Donna, and I told him what I thought about him for telling you. Lyndon protested, but I didn't realize you didn't know, Pat. I'm sorry, I... You're a fool, said Donna. Really, Howard, you are, and I'm getting very annoyed with you. 
Now, what's all this got to do with your father, Pat? He's a crook and a gambler and a murderer. He's so crooked that even other crooks don't trust him. Pooh, said Donna, dismissing it with a wave of her hand. That doesn't matter a bit. It does, Donna. He never told me anything about his business, just that he was a banker, and, and I was so proud of him. And I've been going to Miss Wiganbottom's school and being entertained at all the best homes like yours. And all the time, my father's a notorious criminal. Oh, Pooh, said Donna. That's not your fault. What do I care about your father? Now, you come up to the apartment and forget all this foolishness. But your father, he's so well-bred. Bah, come along. You too, Mr. What's-Your-Name. I guess you can come. Howard, although I'm pretty well disgusted with you for telling Patricia about her father. Lyndon appealed to Dot. It wasn't my fault. I was looking over some old newspapers, looking up publication on a divorce hearing, and I saw Gus Gillen's picture. I thought he looked like Patricia, and the name was similar, so I just saved it and showed it to her as a joke. I never thought of it being her father. I had never seen. Oh, be quiet, said Donna. Come on. They went through the severely modernistic lobby and up to the 10th floor in a self-operated elevator. The Barstow's apartment evidently took up the entire floor. There was only one door off the small entryway. Donna opened that with her key and they went through into the long, low living room. A spindle-legged ornamental dust that evidently belonged discreetly in one corner of the room had been hauled out in the middle of the floor and a man who could have been no one but E.P. Barstow was sitting on a chair in front of it. He was a short, bald-headed man with a fiery red face. There were papers scattered on the desk and in a loose circle on the rug around it. Barstow was chewing on the end of a pencil and staring in grim determination at the papers. As they came in, he spat out part of the pencil's eraser, picked up a bottle of beer from under the table, and took a big swallow. Dad, said Patricia in a choked voice. Gus Gillen was sitting quietly on a couch in the corner. He smiled and nodded shyly. Ah, said E.P. Barstow. Oh, hello, Donna. This is Gus Gillen, Patricia's father. You've never met him, have you? Gus, this is Donna, and that one is Howard Linden. I don't know your other friend, Donna. The name is Dodd, Dodd told him. I have met Mr. Dodd, Gus Gillen said, smiling. All right, Barstow said, beginning to chew the pencil again. If you want to make noise, go somewhere else. I've made a mistake here, and I can't find it. Dad, said Patricia, in an agony of embarrassment. What What are you doing here? E.P. Barstow looked up. What? What do you mean? What is he doing here? Can't I even entertain my partner in my own house anymore? Patricia stared. You said partner? Yes, yes, E.P. Barstow barked. Partner! He furnishes the money and the brains, and I do the work. Donna said, Dad, you never told me. E.P. Barstow glared. Do I have to tell all my business to everyone? Gus is my silent partner. Now, go away, all of you. I'm trying to add these figures. No, said Patricia. No, wait. I want to know, to understand. She was looking at Gus Gillen. I saw an old paper today. There was a picture of you in it. It said that you were a notorious gambler and that you had been arrested in connection with a murder. Murder? E.P. Barstow exploded with laughter. Gus? What a joke. Gus Gillen blinked apologetically. My dear, that was just the work of a young district attorney who was making publicity for himself. I met the murdered man only once. He was killed in New York and I was in San Francisco at the time and easily proved it. I wasn't even held for questioning. But Shine Bravani said you, you... Gus Gillen sighed. I own stock in three racetracks, Patricia. Bravani tried to fix a race at one of them, and I caught him and had him ruled off every track in the country for life. He tried to get even with me several times since. But you told me you were a banker. Well, I own a bank. Three, E.P. Barstow corrected, and not one worth a damn, if you ask me. Gus bought them up to keep them from going under during the Depression. Patricia still looked dazed. The paper said, gambling. Sure, said E.P. Barstow. Gus owns three clubs that run gambling in Reno and Las Vegas. That's his end of our partnership, along with the racetracks. Dodd cleared his throat. It's legal to gamble in Nevada, Patricia. Well, sure it is, said E.P. Barstow. What do you think we are, crooks or something? Patricia seemed to crumple a little. Dad, why didn't you tell me? Gus Gillen looked worried in a bewildered way. Well, dear, 
You see, your mother used to worry terribly about the speculative business of mine. She was afraid I'd lose all my money. And I did, too, several times. And I didn't want you to worry at all. I wanted you to feel secure and, and happy. Patricia straightened up. Oh, I've been a fool. She stared at the others blindly. You see, when Howard showed me that old paper with Dad's picture in it, I, I just couldn't believe, couldn't think straight. I thought I had been going under false pretenses and that my father was a crook. I'd heard Shine Bravani was a gambler and I went to ask him and he told me those lies about Dad. So, so I decided that no matter what my dad was, he was my dad and I was proud of him. I decided I wouldn't pretend any more to be what I wasn't. I was going to get arrested and get my picture in the paper. I gave those rubies to those funny men because I wanted to make a good story out of it. I was going to say I was drunk and everyone would be trying to find the rubies and the story would go all over the country and all my friends would see it and that would show them I didn't care what my father was and that I was just as bad as he was and that if they didn't like me and they didn't like him, they didn't have to like me anymore either. Oh, I've been such a fool. You don't seem to have very good sense, E.P. Barstow agreed, but then maybe you'll grow up after a while. Now, will you please kindly get out of here so I can add these figures? Wait a minute, said Dodd. Speaking of those rubies, there's a couple of things I don't understand. Linden, mud and your shoes. Mud? Linden said blankly. My shoes? There's no mud on my shoes. No, said Dodd. That's what I can't understand. Donna said, well, Howard, you know very well your shoes were covered with filthy mud and that I took you home to change them. Yes, said Dodd. I thought so. I used to have a customer by the name of Grouchy Smith. He was an expert pickpocket. He taught me some of his tricks. Look. He held out his right hand and opened his fingers, and a flat ruby glowed red on his palm. I got this out of your pocket on the way up in the elevator, Linden. Linden slapped his hand over his lower vest pocket. You lie. You couldn't possibly. He stopped short, his thin face suddenly sickly white. Yes, Dot agreed amiably. I lie. The twin of this ruby, the one you took from old smoke when you shot him, is still safe in your pocket. You, you're crazy, Lyndon whispered. No, you showed that picture to Patricia on purpose. You were sure it was her father and that she didn't know he was a gambler. You told her about Shine Bravani and followed her to his place because you knew Bravani hated Gus Gillen. He's always popping off about him and you gambled there a good deal. You figured Patricia would be sick with a shock and that then you could move in and offer her the sanctity and purity of your honored name, and that she'd jump at it like a shot, rather than be known as the daughter of such a notorious character as a newspaper and Shine Bravani painted Gus Gillen as being, and that you would then be in line to get some of Gus Gillen's dough. You weren't making any progress in your attempt to marry Donna for her money, so you thought you'd try someone else. Linton backed against the wall. That's a lie. I don't think so. They're desperate for money. When you saw Patricia give away those rubies, you went after them. You tackled Old Smoke first. He was drunk on the credit he got on the strength of the ruby, but not drunk enough not to know that it was worth a lot more cash than you were offering. He wouldn't deal with you, and you shot him. You thought probably you had been seen and noticed in that district, so you tried to poke the thing off on Craig. You knew Craig, and he was a newspaper man because it was from the Times you had gotten the old newspaper you showed to Patricia, and the interview gag was the best reason you could think of at the moment for anyone prowling around and looking for old smoke in the middle of the night. But unfortunately for him, Craig also knew you. My man Meekins questioned Craig about Donna and you, and Craig began to connect things up. He didn't know about old smoke, but he knew about you and the newspapers and he found out from the court clerk about Patricia and Sam Rudolph, and he must have remembered who Gus Gillen was. He had seen Gus Gillen at the night court. Why were you there, Mr. Gillen? Gillen shrugged, still looking anxiously worried. I always go to night court when I can. I, I was just passing the time away, waiting for Ed. Barstow was staring grimly at Lyndon. Gus pays fines for bums and night courts. That's his private charity. Dodd said, Craig went to my place to wait for me. He wanted some more information. He was an expert at picking locks, and he let himself into my place and made himself comfortable. While he was waiting, he called you up, and he said too much. You knew he could and would connect you with Old Smoke's murder 
as soon as he got the lowdown on Patricia and the rubies. You went to my apartment and shot him. Donna said in a sick voice. Howard, that was, was the phone call you got at your apartment when you were changing your shoes and that, that was where I drove you afterwards. Dodd went on in the same casual tone. Also, you dropped a poker chip in Old Smoke Shack. That tripped you up badly because Shine Bravani thought someone was trying to frame him. Lyndon looked stiff and white and still against the wall. You couldn't prove it, he whispered. You couldn't. He made a stiffly awkward gesture with his right arm, and then he was holding a small nickel-plated automatic. Stand still. All of you, stand. All in one motion, E.P. Barstow leaned over and picked up the beer bottle and threw it with an expert backward flip of his wrist. The heavy end of the bottle took Lyndon squarely between the eyes. His head banged into the wall in back of him, and then he dropped loosely to his knees and slipped forward on his face. Ha, said E.P. Barstow. See that, Gus? And I haven't heaved the beer bottle since I used to tend bar. Tad! Donna shrieked. You? A bartender? Sure, said E.P. Barstow. That's how I met Gus. I was tending bar at the Golden Lady at Frying Pan Creek when Gus was running the faro game there. I was a damn good bartender, too. I'll have you know, young lady. I'll prove it. Dodd, you sit down here and I'll fix you a drink. We might as well be comfortable while we wait for the police. And I want to talk to you about some writing, some fidelity bonds for some of my employees. And then, damn it, I want you all to get out of here while I add these figures. Gus is going to think I'm holding out on him if I don't get the right answer soon.